Okay, take three. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Chapter 11, The Giving and Taking of Gifts, House of the Scorpion. However, before we begin, I'd like to make a quick announcement. By the time this video goes up, I will have a GoFundMe set up to help me get a better mic to record with, because right now I'm just using a headset. I will try to put the link in the description if I remember. I really hope I do. I really don't, you guys don't need to support me, I'm, don't, it's not needed, but I would really appreciate this support to help me get a really good mic to record with, preferably one with a nice windscreen filter so I don't have, so you don't hear me breathing through the recording, like, all the damn time, but, anyway, that should be a lot of the way. Let's get right into chapter 11, the giving and taking of gifts. <clears throat> Matt wandered around the garden, admiring the ice sculptures and a fountain of wine with orange slices bobbing in a red pool. He dipped his finger in to taste. It wasn't as good as it looked. He checked the place cards on the tables and saw that, as usual, he was seated next to El Patron. Mr. McGregor was on El Patron's other side. The other favorite guests were Mr. Alacran Fili and Felicia Benito, back from college, or rather, expelled from college, and Stephen and Tom. Mr. Alacran's father rounded up the guests around the table. Everyone called him El Viejo these days, because he seemed even older than El Patron. Humming to himself, Ma Matt removed Tom's card and put it at the baby table. A nanny sat at each end to keep order, and high chairs were lined up at either side. Matt located Maria's card and placed it next to his. Next, Matt explored the edge of the garden, where the bodyguards formed a sullen dark perimeter. Each of the president's dictators and generals had brought his own protectors, and of course the Alacrans had hired a small army for the party. Matt counted more than 200 men. Who were they guarding against, he wondered. Who was likely to come charging across the poppy fields? But Matt was used to bodyguards at all family affairs, and it seemed natural for them to be there. The sun was setting and the garden was full of cool green light. The Ejo Mountains still glowed purple-brown in the distance, and the poppy fields were tipped with a gold that faded even as Matt watched. Lamps went on in the trees. "'You pig!' cried Maria, who had for a ball and cliff and constant a bag slung over her shoulder. "'Just once you could be nice to Tom. I've moved his card right back.' "'I'm punishing him for trying to drown Furball,' said Matt. "'What on earth are you talking about?' Furball couldn't have fallen into the toilet and pulled the top down. It isn't possible. Tom did it. He couldn't be that evil, said Maria. Since when? Anyhow, it's my party and I get to say who sits where. Matt was beginning to lose his patience with Maria. He was trying to be nice to her and she was taking it all wrong. They eat mush at the baby table. Good, said Matt. He fetched Tom's card and replaced it. Maria reached over and grabbed it and she grabbed her wrist quite hard. Ow, that hurts. I'm going to stay here. No, you aren't, said Matt. I'll do whatever I like. Matt ran back to the table with, to his side, his table with Maria trying to push past him and grab her place card. El Patron had arrived. El Patron had arrived along with McGregor and the others. What's this? What's this? said El Patron. Matt and Maria skidded to a halt. I want her to sit next to me, said Matt. The old man laughed a dry, dusty sound. Is she a little girl? Your girlfriend? Your novia? That's disgusting, said Mr. Alacran. Is it? El Patron chuckled. Matt's no different than I was at that age. Matt's a clone. He's my clone. Sit here, girl. Make room for a Tamlin. Tamlin found a place setting for Maria. He frowned at it. Where's Tom? Felicia said. Everyone turned back at her. Felicia was so quiet and seldom seen, most people seemed to forget she existed. Where's Tom? El Patron turned Tim to Matt. I put him at the baby table, said Matt. You pig, shouted Maria. El Patron laughed. That's the stuff, me, Vita. Get rid of your enemies when you can. I don't like Tommy there, and dinner will be better without him. Felicia balled up her napkin for, in her fist, but she didn't say anything. I don't want to stay here. I want to be with Tom, cried Mira. Well, you can't, Matt said flatly. Why did she always have to stick up for him? Why didn't she even stop to think? There was no way Furball could have pulled down the lid on top of himself. But she didn't believe Matt, because he was only a disgusting clone. A dull rage at the unfairness of it swept over him. Do as you're told, the girl. El Patron suddenly lost interest in the drama that, and turned to Mr. McGregor on his other side. 
Maria, choking back tears, was pushed up to the table by Tamlin. I'll see he gets the same food as the rest of us, he whispered. No, you won't, said Matt. Tamlin raised his eyebrows. Is that a direct order, Master Matt? <clears throat> yes. Matt tried to ignore Maria's soft whimpers as she sh strove not to draw attention to herself. If she couldn't bring herself to punish Tom, he would do it for her. Food was brought and served. Maria selected bits to feed Furball and continued to stare down on her lap. Fetal braid implants. I must try that sometime, said McGregor. It's done wonders for you. Don't put it off too long, El Patron advised. You have to give the doctors at least five months' lead time. Eight is better. I won't be able to use... Oh no, he's much too old. Felicia was staring down at her plate with almost as much dejection as Maria. She wasn't even pretending to eat. She drank from a tall glass that was regularly filled by a servant. She looked pleadingly at McGregor, although Matt couldn't guess what she could f want from him. In any case, he ignored her. And so did her husband, and everyone else for that matter. El Viejo, Mr. Alacran's father, spilled his food and made a mess on the tablecloth. No one paid attention to him either. See, there's an example of someone who didn't get his implants when he should have, said El Patron, pointing to El Viejo. Father decided against it, said Mr. Alacran. He's a fool, then. Look at him, Matt. Would you believe that's my grandson? Matt hadn't worked out the exact relationship between El Viejo and El Patron before. It hadn't seemed important. El Patron looked ancient, no doubt about it, but his mind was very sharp. At least it, at least now it was. After those whatever they were implants, El Viejo could hardly stir, string a sentence together, and some of the time he sat in the room and screamed. Celia said that happened to some old people, and that Matt mustn't worry about it. I could believe he's your grandfather, said Matt. El Patron laughed, spraying food particles all over his plate. That's what comes of not taking care of yourself. Father decided implants were immortal, said Mr. Alacran, and I honored his decision. A sudden intake of breath around the table told Matt that Mr. Alacran had done something dangerous. He's deeply religious. He thinks God put him on this earth for some, for a certain number of years and that he mustn't ask for more. El Patron stared at Mr. Alacran for a long moment. I'll overlook your rudeness, he said at last. It's my birthday and I'm in a good mood. But someday you'll be old too. Your body will fall apart and your brain will deteriorate. See if you're so high-minded then. He went back to eating and everyone relaxed. May I check up on Tom? Felicia said in her uncertain way. Stay out of this, growled Mr. Alacran. I only wanted to see if he had food. For God's sake, he's capable of standing on his own hind legs and finding something to eat. Those were Matt's sent sentiments too, but he was surprised at the anger Mr. Alacran showed toward Felicia. How could anyone get mad at her? She was so helpless. Felicia hung her head and withdrew into silence. After dinner, Tamlin rolled El Patron to the Bogvania Arbor for the gift-giving. Mr. McGregor excused himself because he had to rest up for an operation. Matt was glad to see him go. El Patron set great importance on gifts. You can tell how much someone loves you by the size of the present, he often told Matt. He preferred to receive gifts rather than give them. The flow of wealth should be from outside. El Patron opened his arms wide as though he were about to hug someone. In. El Patron gave himself a big bear hug instead. Matt thought this was very funny. Daft Donald and Tamlin brought the boxes to El Patron. Matt read the cards and tore off the wrappers. A secretary recorded who had given what and the value of the gift. Watches, jewelry, paintings, statues, and moon rocks piled up on the lawn. Matt thought the moon rocks looked like something he could find anywhere in the Aho Mountains, but they came with a certificate and were very expensive. The Fated Princess gave El Patron a statue of a naked baby with wings, one of the few gifts he seemed to like. Matt gave him a wallet that looked like, looked good in a catalog and now seemed shabby next to the other present. You'd need a wallet as big as the Grand Canyon to hold El Patron's paper money, Celia said, and you have to drain the Gulf of California for a small change. The farmer's one law gave weapons, guns that responded to one's voice, lasers that could burn an intruder to a crisp from the other side of a wall, flying mini-bombs and a clamp that clamped themselves onto enemy's skin. The latter were programmed to re recognize specific people. Tamlin took the weapons the way the minute Matt unwrapped them. Open your presents, mi vida. Uh, open your presents, mi vida, El Patron said after a long while. His eyes were half-closed and he looked almost bloated with all the gifts he received. A mountain of new possessions surrounded his wheelchair. Matt eagerly opened a small box from Celia. It was a hand-knitted sweater. 
She'd found time to knit, Matt didn't know. Where she found time to knit, knit Matt didn't know. Tamlin gave him a book identifying edible plants in the desert. El Patron gave him a battery-driven big car and battery-driven car big enough to sit in. It had flashing lights and a siren. Matt was too old for such things, but he knew the car had been very expensive, therefore El that El Patron had loved him very much. Maria snatched away the present she'd bought him. I don't want to give you anything, she cried. Give that back, Matt said angrily and uh, that she made a scene in front of everyone. You don't deserve it, Maria started to run away, but she halted by her father, Senator Mendoza. Hand him the box, said Senator Mendoza. He was mean to Tom. Do it. Maria wavered for a moment, then flung the box as far as she could. Pick it up and bring it to me, Matt said. He was in a cold rage. Let her go, said Tamlin in a low voice, but Matt wasn't in the, any mood to listen. Maria had insulted him in front of everyone, and he intended to make her pay. That's the stuff, El Patron said gleefully. Make your woman toe the line. Get it now, said Matt with the same cold, deadly voice he'd heard El Patron use on terrified servants. Please, Maria, Senator Mendoza coaxed gently. Sobbing, she retrieved the president and thrust it at Matt. I hope you choke on it. Matt was trembling and afraid he'd lose control and start crying, too. Suddenly, he remembered what El Patron said earlier. Is she your little girlfriend? Why wouldn't Maria... Why shouldn't Maria be his girlfriend? Why should he be different from everyone because he was a clone? When he looked in the mirror, he saw no difference between himself and the others. It was unfair that he was treated like Furball when he had good grades and could name the planet's brightest stars in the, all the constellations. One more thing, Matt said. I demand a birthday kiss. Gasps ricocheted around the crowd. Senator Mendoza turned ash and put his hand protectively on Maria's shoulders. Don't do this, murmured Tamlin. El Patron beamed with delight. It's my party too, said Matt, and I can have anything I want. Isn't that so, mi Patron? It's so, my little fighting cock. Give him the kiss, girl. He's a clone, Senator Mendoza cried. He's my clone. Suddenly, El Patron wasn't the jovial birthday host anymore. He seemed dark and dangerous, like a creature you might stumble on in the middle of the night. Matt remembered Tamlin's words about his master. He grew large and green until he shattered over the whole forest, but most of his branches are twisted. Matt was sorry he'd started this whole affair, but it was too late now. Do it, Maria, Senator Mendoza. I won't let this happen again, I promise. The Senator didn't know that Maria had kissed Matt on several occasions, just as he, she kissed Furball and anything else that pleased her. Matt knew this was different, though. He was humiliating her. If it had been Tom asking for the kiss, no one would have cared. People would have thought it was cute for a boy to flirt with his novia. <clears throat> Matt wasn't a boy. He was a beast. Maria came up to him, no longer angry or rebellious. She reminded him of Felicia, bent over sadly over her plate. For an instant, he wanted to say, Stop, it was a joke, I didn't mean it. But it was too late. El Patron was watching them with obvious glee, and Matt realized it might be dangerous to draw back now. Who knew how the old man might punish Maria if he had his fun spoiled now? Maria leaned forward, and Matt felt the cold brush of her lips on his skin. Then she ran to her father and collapsed in tears. He gathered her up and sh shouldered his way through the crowd. The paralysis had seized everyone broke. Everyone started talking at once, not about what just happened, but about anything else. Matt felt their eyes on him, accusing, disgusted, repelled. El Patron had wearied of the excitement. He signaled Tamlin and Daft Donald to take him away was already being carried up the steps before Maria Matt noticed. <clears throat> the party went on with renewed spirit now that El Patron was gone, but no one talked to Matt. No one seemed to notice he was even there. After a while, he gathered up his smaller pe presents, leaving the battery-driven car for the servants to attend to. Matt made, his Matt made his way to Celia's apartment and laid out Celia's sweater and Tamlin's book. Then he opened Maria gifts. It was a box of taffy she'd made on with her own hands. He knew... He knew because she had told him about it ahead of time. She was no good at keeping secrets. Matt knew Maria hoarded things, worn-out shirts, broken toys, and gift wrapping paper, and she got hysterical if anything went missing. Celia said it was because she'd lost her mother when she was only five. One day, Maria's mother had walked out of the house and never returned. No one knew where she'd gone, or if they did, they weren't talking about it. When Maria was small, she'd imagined her mother had gotten lost in the desert. She woke up at night crying that she could hear her mother's voice, but of course she couldn't. Ever since then, Celia said Maria had hung, a hung on to things. It was why she rarely let Furball out of her sight, and why the dog was such a wimp. Maria had cut squares from her treasured gift wrapping paper and used them to wrap Matt's taffy. 
He felt terrible looking at them. Why hadn't he listened to Tam when we just told her to let her go? He closed the box and put it away. Celia had drawn the curtains in his room. As always, she had lit the candle in front of the virgin. The virgin looked shabby with her hip, her chipped robe, and cheap plastic flowers, but Matt wouldn't have wanted her to look any other way. He crawled under the covers. Feeling around, he found the lump that was his stuffed bear. He would have died rather than admit Maria that he still slept with it. That is the end of chapter 11. I hope you guys enjoyed, and remember, link to the GoFundMe in the description. You don't have to help at, by any means, but it would be much appreciated. And those who do support me will be shouted out on the channel. And until next time, guys, I will see you all next video.